<clears throat> Good evening, everyone. My name is Tyrone Amad. Right. And as always, I want to thank Almighty God for everything. Uh, the good, the bad, the indifference, the get the fuck ons. I don't never want to see your ass no more. I want to thank him for everything. Because it's easy to recover your ass off when everything's going your way, Nikki. You can recover your ass off, boy, when you singing kumbayas and, you know, all the deacons is saying, bless you, brother. Uh, you, you know, you got it in me. But can you thank God when things is going downhill and you in the bowels of depravity with your clean time? And, and, and when they asked me to share, I said to Pat, I said, well, Pat, you know, I'm sort of like an N.A. terrorist. I, you know, I'm known to boldly go where the addicts haven't been before. Uh, I'm, I'm sort of to pull a stunt, you know. But, but I appreciate the group that put this together, the West Georgia area, whoever got involved in this. Because the thing about, the thing about uh, uh, when you do something different in Narcotics Anonymous, it sort of uh, uh, messes up. Uh, if, if you're a Trekkie like me and you go outside the realm, you know what I mean? If you color outside the lines, and I saw I'm ideal to speak for this because I'm always outside the line. Yeah. I don't have a problem being by myself. I'm a Leo only child. I play with people y'all can't see <laughs> right now. <laughs> and, 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 and the one thing I'll say though, that, that, that uh, events such as this here is, is, is new. The new possibilities is arising because the dreams that we had to awaken came from the dreams we would at first admit that had went to sleep. See, the thing about being here for a long period of time, you know, you can get a lot of time, but what comes with that, you got to get old. I've been to the bathroom four times before I got up here. <laughs> you see what I'm saying? You know what I'm saying, Will, but that, everybody wants a lot of clean time, but they don't want to get old. So, so, so getting old comes with this, but with getting old comes some other stuff that the literature talks about. You know what I mean? And as I look around the room right now, I say they should have a medevac sitting outside because any one of us could, any one of us could go down at any minute. You know what I mean? And, and I'm a little silly, you know, but but I've been coming. I've been coming, and some people in this room that seen me when I come in the first day. So 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 you know you can't tell a NA story without telling how it was, what happened, how it is today. It's always about the dope. I, my greatest fear is that I'll have a good idea, won't come tell y'all about it, and then act on it. Because we've seen that happen, ain't we, Vernon? We didn't see people with a lot of time come up with a good idea. Don't say nothing about it. And if we see them again, they badly mangle. So, so being old and doing this a lot, I know to write shit down. Because my mind ain't what it used to be. <laughs> it just ain't what it used to be. And everybody know I've been on the circuit since I was a new guy on the burn them. I might have had when I was three years, I was a main speaker and I was going around the country sharing like Shakespeare, but I was living like a reindeer. <laughs> because that's what happens when you knew. If you if you like me, you know for a fact that all your early step work was written by the disease. <laughs> You couldn't have known all that, Mitch. You couldn't have known it. Not when you've been behind enemy lines in a neon suit for years. I used dope from 13 to 38. When I started using skag, junk, we used to buy $2 buttons of doji. Now you know I'm old. We, we use names like skag, doji, junk. You know, we didn't say heroin. Who said that? Most of us couldn't even spell heroin. And, 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 so, and so everybody that, I want everybody to feel included here. This is the greatest gathering of the people who cut that one class in high school that we all should have made, the drug education class. <laughs> when you come to the NA meeting, I know that's why you're here. You the one cut class with me. You hung out in the pool hall. You stayed in the bathroom. You did everything but go to the drug education class. So welcome, you bunch of losers. <laughs> and, and the reason I can say that and laugh about it, because in our literature, in the, in the, in the flat book, it tell you in the first step, 
that you fought and lost an exhaustive battle with drugs. So you're a loser. Don't get upset to call me a loser. You're a loser. You didn't win. <laughs> but I know for a fact that after that long using dope, man, a whole lot happened to me. I didn't stop till I was 38 years old. When I came to the program, I had been on the same job 20 years. I retired after 42 years, three months, and 18 days off one job. I've been married four times. Two of them escaped, the rest ran off. <laughs> I ain't gonna even talk about all the ships I've been aboard. Especially the ones I can't even remember the names of some of them. And I'm talking about when the disease of addiction is active without the dope. Let's talk about active addiction without the dope after I got here and had been clean for a while. And then the manifestation of the disease of addiction started to spread its tentacles in the areas of my life, Sean, that I wouldn't admit to. So I write stuff down because my mind's still bad. You can't use dope for 25 years and your mind don't be bad. And the steps don't just make your mind good. It don't. But I learned some over a period of time, man, from getting a lot of go-ahead-on knots on my head. <laughs> and see, a go-ahead-on knot is when God's going to give you an understanding, but it, the understanding don't come until the swelling go down. <laughs> and, that, and I mean, that's my learning curve. I'm not one who can just read it and get it. You know what I'm saying? The, the, the worst piece of information we ever shared in human history in human history is that experience is the best teacher. Uh, wrong answer. Education is the best teacher. What you get when you don't have one is an experience. We'll let that catch up. Because the literature says we experimented with drugs, right? We experimented with drugs. And so when you get clean and you've been so indulgent in the defects that comes along with the disease of addiction, you have to experiment with spiritual principles. So this is one of the greatest social experiments ever in the, embarked on by in the history of mankind. When they wrote the original literature, say even the addicts themselves said this wouldn't be done. But here we are now sitting here, a room full of old people. <laughs> who experimented with drugs, and we the survivors of the war on drugs. We the walking wounded. And the greatest message is you can walk in this room and collect up a whole lot of artifacts. <laughs> which, 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 which brings me to, 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 to giving the committee a little more kudos, because when you do anything different in Narcotics Anonymous, yeah you usually criticize and ostracize. It's just, it just comes with it. It just comes with it. But in order to recover, you got to do something different. Most of us want to get better, but we don't want to do nothing no different. We want to run off and hide out in church. Or we want to collect things and conditions we would equate with recovery just to still be spiritually hemorrhaging and your clean time won't let you come to the meeting and share about the exact nature of who you're not. Stop. 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 So, and so I was looking at the program when, when, I, when I got the program earlier uh, and I looked and it was a book in it and the book had blank pages. And if you look at every piece of literature that's ever been written that we ever said, you always open the book up to a blank page. Now this blank page is the most powerful piece in this book to me at 30 years. I turned 30 December 5th, 1989. So when Pat asked me, I said, I'm the new guy. She said, well, you open up Friday night. That's what you ought to do. <laughs> but it took me to the thought that the blank page, man, has become so powerful because what I realized over the years of being here and in the trenches fighting the disease of addiction and sometimes aiding and abetting the disease with time. Because clean time would let me come to the meeting and get to the exact nature of what I was feeling, even though the literature had told me in the IP for the newcomer that I was going to come face to face with feelings I never coped with successfully, Sean. I never coped with the feeling of inadequacy. I never coped with the feeling of, of, of doing the revolution 
that uh, I was supposed to be a black panther, but I couldn't grow no fro, so I was an anther. I couldn't grow no fro. <laughs> I ain't never had no more head than what you see. But the inadequacy that came from, and I'm gonna share about the inadequacy when you got time, man. How time can start to make you feel inadequate because the things you used to do all night, you can't do hardly at night. <laughs> I ain't joking, man. I'm talking about feelings. See, see, if, if they hadn't have came up with the name of addiction, they, they would have called us the feelers. Because we always feeling something. We always feeling something. Alicia, sometimes I feel stuff that's not con con uh, conditional, that, that comes with the disease of addiction. See, I learn because, you know, I read so much. I read people say, you know, run yourself crazy reading. I probably am. But I'm going to keep reading because the disease of addiction keeps reading. The disease of addiction still reads. And what it does, it reads the addict's feeling that if it can tap into the inadequacy that you feel, you got your egregious, you got your slick car, you got your big house, but you still wake up every day and have a bag of nothing if you ain't got that conscious contact with God. See, now, I, people say, well, how does he... He's a gambling, rooting, tooting, whoremongering, hang at the titty bar type guy. What does he know about God? Trust me, we in constant contact. That's the only way I survive. Because there's some, been some times in my life and my recovery that y'all ain't been visible or available. Because you know at any given moment, an addict can be not user friendly. Yeah. And, 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 and so I'm going to talk about the blank page, right? The blank page, man, shows up in them areas of your life where the tentacles and spread itself into your addiction and you can't see it. Because see what you can't see, you won't talk about. You'll go right back to being the little kid. I don't see you. I don't see you. I'm talking about the disease of addiction <clears throat> manifests itself in a variety of mental obsession, compulsive action, got nothing to do with the dope. What's active addiction look like with no drugs in sight? What keeps you going back time and time again to that same pain, finding distorted security in that familiar pain, Sean, rather than let go for the unknown? Huh? What's it like standing in a relationship that's been sunk 10 years ago? I'm talking about when you become a necrophiliac. Anybody who don't know what a necrophiliac is, a person who has a fondness for dead things. You know, they, I'm sure down here in Atlanta, they bust an undertaker every now and then humping a dead body. <laughs> well, y'all asked me to come. I told Pat, Pat, you know, I'm not real shy. And I'm not afraid to talk about me and my disease. Because the disease of addiction ain't no punk. And it'll take your time, and your time will make you a punk. Because you won't challenge the disease and get the help that you need by saying it openly. Even though we already been told that three things was indispensable. With these, we well on our way. Well, you standing still if you ain't practicing what's indispensable. Your time then froze you again. So I've been frozen in time, man. What happened was, man, in my, in my 20th year, my best friend died on my 20th anniversary. And I realized that I had put in a lot of work that was fictitious. Because the few friends that I had left showed up, and I didn't even recognize who my real friends were. Because I'd been so accustomed to the window dressings. <laughs> you know how when we get an outfit like this here, we accessorize it. So I've been in the mirror about 45 minutes early accessorizing myself. <laughs> Because sometimes the only thing that'll make you feel good about yourself is what you find inside yourself. But it's hard to find that when you're looking through the eyes that's got spiritual cataracts in it. That's why the blank page is so mysterious. I'm gonna keep taking you back to the blank page. See, this page is blank, but it's so powerful because it's got so much on it. But the only way to see what's on that page is you gotta look inside. I had to start looking inward and upward, not outward and downward. 
And once I made the transition and got some new lens to start seeing myself to, I could see my connection with God. I could see the day that the pistol was cocked in my ear, Tony, and it didn't go off. Earlier, brother was telling me, he said, man, yeah, you from the south side, that was all gangsters. Man, I was a wankster. When come time to go to jail, I quit. Yeah. Listen, I got a jail story that's so short, it ain't going to take me but two minutes to tell you. The judge said 20 to life, I fainted in the courtroom. I was done being a gangster. I ain't had a pistol in my hand since 1972. And the crazy part about it is, I got locked up for a stick up with a paycheck in my pocket. I'm that kid that became a chief student business agent in the unions when he was 20 years old. I hung out with Lane Kirkland and George Meany, people like that, the, the, the titans of labor, as a kid. When I got here to, to the program, I had 20 years on the railroad. I was getting money when money wasn't even fashionable. I was living so far off Lake Shore Drive, you couldn't find the, take the bus up there. But that didn't mean nothing to the disease of addiction. I'm that guy who used to do career days in the high schools. You would send your kid to school, and I would tell him, you might want to be like me. I look at this wonderful career I have after I stopped in the projects and copped. I'm talking about, man, the things that you look back at that now terrorize you because you realize that you done ruined a wonderful life. And then get here and get clean and build a wonderful life and don't know how to appreciate it. Because there's something that's moving around in our fellowship now that, that, that may be somewhat dangerous. It's very challenging, especially with time. It's called AI. Artificial intelligence. Because <laughs> rather than talk to... <clears throat> I tell my sponsee, rather than talk, you want to text. Yes. If you text me, I got two in me, okay and no. <laughs> That's it. Because what's happening to us as a fellowship, Mitch, is, is that AI is starting to overwhelm us. It's starting to get to the point that rather than have the constant contact, the human contact is so needed that our literature taught us we rather text. We don't want to be face to face and so people can see that you're going through. I'm going to send you an emoji to say how you feeling. What? What the fuck is an emoji? So it's been very uh, dangerous, man. And, and, and so I said to myself, the commitment that I'm going to make to God in this fellowship is I'm going to get right to talking about what we ain't saying that we slowly committing suicide, Vern, because we're getting so far away from the basics that work for us, not that we shouldn't improve, because if you go right now to any store and buy any product, they got some new and improved shit. Thank God that we evolve in the way we are now, and this is a great piece to use. This is part of the evolution of our fellowship, but we don't want to get so far away that we don't understand that the steps still work. Ain't no no www.step2.com. That shit's not going to work. Because you'll, over, you'll overdose on stupidity. You'll get so intelligent that artificial intelligence won't let you pick up the phone no more. The steps still work like x lax Don't take one till you're ready to clean out. Or you can just try. Take your x lax and then change your mind. <laughs> but I'm sharing because people with 30 years, man, time will become your enemy. Time will become your enemy because it won't let you stay to the exact nature. The normalization of deviance speaks to a process that we know that came from a three, four million dollar research deal that they did, Sean, when, this, when the space shuttle blew up, we did this big ass research development thing, right? We gonna find out what happened. Well, what happened was, is just like we do with, with character defects. They seen the little bitty O-ring that only cost $100 malfunction, but the shuttle went up and it came back. 
So they sent it up again with the same O-ring bag, but it went up and it came back. And then the last time when it failed, we went to studying it. Just like we do with character defects that come from the disease of addiction. We can function with them, but one day they gonna blow up. So thus the terminology, the normalization of devious. I have some things about myself that are normal, it's what I do, but it's deviating away from the spiritual principle that's supposed to be embodied in the steps. But since I function with it so well, I continue to indulge in the defect, not recognizing that it's clouded my ability to think logically, and now AI is in control. I've created a spiritual, artificial intelligence that's making me believe that who I am is who I was designed to be, so now I've become something that I'm not. Y'all stay with me now. I ain't going to lose nobody because you know I'm kind of crazy. Uh, so as part of the story, I came to Narcotics Anonymous straight from Timberland Psychiatric Institute. <laughs> The railroad spent $138,000 in 1989, which would be a half million dollars in today's money, to be, I was this test uh, project. I was their tester. They was going to see, could we just send one and one get it right? Because everybody else kept going to treatment, coming back and getting high, and going to treatment, coming back and getting high. They said, well, let's try one different. So they sent me to the nut house. And that's another story, because it was December 1989, it was a blizzard. So I got up, they was getting ready to transport me to the treatment place in Dallas, and I said, listen, I'm not flying, uh, I'm not driving, uh, I got to take the train. So I get cold shop, I put on this custom-made cashmere coat <clears throat> from Marshall Fields, because you know we named it. I got on designer sweater and pants, John, I got the gloves to match. Of course, I got my hat slightly cocked to the side because I'm a G. And I board the train. It's December the 25th, Christmas Day, 1989. I arrive in Dallas, Texas the next day. Of course, I get out of my sleeper. I put my outfit back on. I step off the train, get to the cab. and says, hey, I want to go to so-and-so, so-and-so. The guy rolls the window up. What's wrong with this redneck? So I go to the next one. I said, hey, buddy, I want you to take me to so-and-so, so-and-so. He rolls the window up. So about the fifth cab, the guy said, well, come on, by God, I'll take you. Now, what I didn't recognize at the time, no, Sean, is that here I am in a full-length wool coat, wool pants, wool sweater. It's 76 degrees. <laughs> and the address I'm telling him is the Psychiatric Institute. We talking, about the, we talking about the disease of addiction. We talking about the disease of addiction will make you get dressed up to go to the crazy house. Now, it's a funny story now, but, but that was not a funny story until I got to the point that I could take a look at what I wouldn't take a look at. So see what you won't take a look at, you won't talk about. Yeah, old timers. You won't talk about what you won't take a look at. And when you get to the wretchedness that comes with time, because we can indulge in some stuff that's so creepy, so, you know, because I just, I like creeps. People tell me, see somebody with me, listen, babe, we ain't got to ask you no lot of questions. The people that know me know if you were Tyrone, you a creep. <laughs> you only like creepy people. He, I'm, listen, I'm not one of them ones who ain't going to lay hands on the newcomers. I have to cut all that bullshit out. I'm going to get the new off up before y'all do. <laughs> now, you don't have to tell about yours. I'm telling you about mine. But we all got one somewhere. There's a body laying. I know y'all all walking hand in hand with the high power and just practicing spiritual principles everywhere you go. I'm sure. But the disease of addiction won't let you talk about it. The disease of addiction made me a deaf mute. 
Why I walked in the meeting in pain and couldn't open my mouth because the disease of addiction had his hand up my back like the ventriloquist dummy. And shut up. But when I did share, I was talking about great bits of nothing I had no fucking experience at. That's why the literature says having had as a result. You can't get no results without first having the experiment. See, most of us don't want to experiment because we're afraid. And fear is such a deadly weapon when it comes to practicing spiritual principles. And one day I decided at 25 I wanted to be free. So my then fourth wife said, four days into our fourth year, four days from our four year anniversary said, me and her was through like Hitler with a Jew. She was done. She didn't want no more money. She didn't want no more trips. She just wanted to be free of me. <laughs> now, let me tell you what it's like when you have to accept the reality that you didn't become a whole lot of everything but nothing to nobody. After all you've acquired, after all you've desired, and then you look up and there's nobody there but you and who's looking back at you in the mirror ain't you. How the disease of addiction has transformed me into somebody I didn't know or understand with no dope. Very sobering, isn't it? You have a, another blank page moment. Back to the blank page. Your blank page moment is coming. And that blank page moment ain't no joke. Because what happens is, what you won't talk about, you won't accept. You can't see what you won't look at. And you ain't going to talk about what you won't see. And you ain't going to accept anything that makes you feel inadequate. But aging brings on inadequacy, folks. Let me be the carrier of the good mail. If you stay above ground, some things are gonna change. But if your spiritual condition stays intact, it'll be the basis for a successful recovery. And it's been my spiritual condition and the people that genuinely love me for just me, not just me and my good self, but just me and myself. Cause I ain't defect free. I don't even wanna be. Let me talk about that. I just wanna be me. And that changes daily. Some days I feel like Captain Kirk. Some days I want to be Huey P. Newton. Some days I want to be Superfly. Some days. But most days I'm happy to be a recovering addict. But that's very challenging every day. Imagine coming to the meetings and you the old timer at every meeting you go to. Where does the help get help from? Who helps the help? The sheep don't feed the shepherd. Thus, I'm glad you guys having this idea. This, this is a new idea. See, in, in order for us to get a new idea in place, we got to first take the risk of being ostracized and criticized. We were having a lively discussion out earlier for this when I first got here about uh, the 11 tradition and anonymity and all that. And I said, well, when those were written, we were hiding out. We were on the run. You didn't say you was an addict out loud. Nobody said that. We were hiding out then. This is a worldwide known organization now. When are we going to stop hiding? When are we going to see that God's grace is real? The greatest evidence, Charlie C. always said, the greatest evidence that God is real, you walk in a room full of addicts and they all clean. But I know there's two types of people you're going to meet in Narcotics Anonymous. You're going to meet some wonderful examples and some horrible warnings. God uses them both. And you have to make the decision whether or not you're going to be a wonderful example of the horrible warning. Now, both are very significant. 
What's the significance of the horrible warning? Are you the one who's talking about what Pat and them did and didn't do? Hmm. But you ain't, I look at the ones that's got the little vest on that's doing the service work, that's doing the hugging and giving direction. Wonderful examples. Prestigious positions to me. They don't get no bows. They don't nobody call them up to the podium. But they're serving God in the highest capacity. Because they're giving them themselves and their time. Their greatest gift that God gives us all is our time. So for those of you who gave your time to make this happen, kudos to you. Because artificial intelligence will tell you, you ain't nobody. Your name ain't even on, on nothing. But the imprint that we're leaving in this society, in this society, the imprint that we leave in now is going to be the one, Tony, when the generations that come behind us are going to say, when did they do that? Who was there? Who hugged you first? Remember your very first hug that made you feel a part of this thing? That person made an impact. So what are you doing to impact the growth and development of this fellowship? Or are you still the one throwing rocks at the little glass house? Afraid to come inside and duck the glass. The living clean says when we get here first we take, then we give. Yeah, we all took something. We took some for granted. We took somebody's heart. We took somebody's trust. But at some point, we realize that we can only keep what we have by giving it away. But you got to get something to give. Now, if you ain't got nothing yet and you got all this time, hmm, your time suspect. We may wonder if you've joined us yet. I'm just saying. Sometimes we don't have nothing to give. We've stayed here a long time. What's that look like? Looks like you've been a war criminal. Now let me explain it. I don't like getting their feelings. <coughs> in, the, in, in our literature, it talks about we come here and we develop certain characteristics that we would associate with criminal behavior. It's criminal to come here and get something and don't get nothing back. You still putting a dollar in the goddamn basket and got a million dollar job, but you still putting a dollar in the fucking basket. You a war criminal. You a thief. How the hell do you still put a dollar in the basket? You got an 80, 90,000, 200,000. I got a six figure job, but you put a dollar in the basket. You a thief. You stealing from us. I don't blame the world for going to direct contributions. Makes sense to me. Maybe you'll do better if don't nobody see you putting that down. So maybe you send a dollar a month. I don't but I got another piece I want to cover. Another couple pieces I want to about time as your enemy. When your time turns against you. When your time turns against you, puts you in that position because you know when you come to the meeting and you're celebrating the anniversary and you got all these little sponsorees with all these goddamn balloons falling behind you, like <laughs> It's a setup by the disease. It's a setup by the disease that wants you to be seen as different. It will alienate you away from the new person who may be the very one to carry this message to you when can't nobody else do it. See, it's very difficult to be trustful when you ain't trustworthy. So my time between 25 and 30, I started to have a lot of questions for the blank page. Because the thing about when you get in touch with your own infirmary of your character, that you start to see how fragile you really are. You can drop cotton on your feet and hurt your feelings now. 
good brother over there that I, uh, doing my other business. We was down in Iowa somewhere. He was telling me about his feelings that he had encountered when I, my guy went and cut the damn tape off on him, right? And that, that was good stuff. And I appreciate that, Dave, because sometimes with time, we become insensitive. I'm just talking about me. I have become insensitive to the needs of the newer members. And even more so to feelings of those with more time than me. Because we say silly shit like, long as you've been clean, you ain't got through that. Hell no. <laughs> no, I ain't got through it. I still got some unaddressed issues. I got some things that still go back when we wasn't black and proud. I'm the kid, you know, that rode the colored car back and forth from Greenwood, Mississippi to Chicago. I told Tony this story, I used to ride the goddamn colored car with the note on my neck. I still got some fucking issues, Wilbur. I ain't processed a lot of that shit. I'm easily offended. Don't call me black. Never wanted to be black. Okay, don't get quiet, goddamn. Sorry. Sorry. But I come up in that era, and Wilbur talked about that era, I came up in that era. You know what I mean? I wanted to be with the Cleavers. You know what I'm saying? But I lived down in the hood. Me and Johnny and them, we come off 58th Street. We had glass, not grass. We played in the fucking vacant lots. What no park district. The park district was where we went to playing at. That was the park district. I'm that kid who had to drink out the colored fountain. So I got some fucking issues, man. Yeah, and they don't just go away because you get clean. The social ills that we face in society, we come into the fellowship with them. That's why this room is looking so marvelous. I'm like, oh, man, I'm, you know, I'm usually being down here on the chitlin circuit. <laughs> you know, but this is, this is extraordinary. I mean, this is an extraordinary event because it reflects the diversity of our fellowship as it should look. been doing this for a while, so I know to get to write on what I came to deliver. Uh, that's why I make these notes. So, so, so in the, in, in the late, latest publication that we just put out, uh, uh, it, it's got a piece that I think we should focus on more often. In, in, in the third tradition uh, of the guiding principles, uh, it, 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 it gives us a piece that just makes all the sense in the world to me that uh, we should never look over, should never take it for granted but we should always uh, be so grateful that God has thought so much of us for so long that he's given us something else that we can still inspire desire to stay clean. Because your clean time sometimes is, is, is just like when you've been in one ship a long time. Sometimes your desire fluctuates. That's why I admire you. Now, since you've, been, you've been with somebody 20 years. You've been with somebody 20 what? 30 years? Man, I done had four wives and ain't got 10 years out of none of they motherfucking ass. <laughs> Y'all the most amazing goddamn people to me. I'd be like, damn. So I watch y'all. Because I want to, but shit, I'm damn near 79. But the odds is pretty low. <laughs> I don't think I'm going to get 30 nothing. I'm not going to even get another 30 years clean. That's why I don't mess around. So, but check this out. We find a home in N.A. I did. I found a home in N.A. And then we find a home inside that home. Home inside a home. When, when I go out to West Coast out there with Will and Dad's in there, man, I'd be at home. I'm the same clown and ass person I am here that I am there. Because I'm free to be me. I took the steps. It was like the x lax of the spirit that I needed to flush myself of what had me spiritually constipated and emotionally hostage to y'all bullshit. Because you can come in the fellowship and pick up a lot of bullshit. <clears throat> That's dangerous. Because with time, you start to become dogmatic. We forget what's indispensable, and most of all, what open mindedness really looked like. I was telling my grand Tony that I said, man, listen. Stay fluid with your open-mindedness because you're going to come face-to-face -face with some shit you ain't cope with successfully, and then you're going to come up on something that you ain't never experienced before. And if you ain't fluid in your open-mindedness, you'll get locked and loaded and constipated. 
So the steps are for spiritual constipation. A power greater than me restored me to greatness. Not goodness. Fried chicken is good. Sex is good. I'm here to be great. I believe that greatness is our birthright. We just gave it away because we picked up dope. Missed the drug education class. <laughs> so within the weird, within the wide, weird, wonderful world of NA membership, we find our tribe. It said, wide, weird. So if I see you jumping out of airplane, sniffing elephant farts, welcome. <laughs> I expect you to be weird. You can't use dope 10, 15, 20 years and not be weird. It's just natural. Why would you nod, Travis, for 10 years, wake up, take a blast, run down the street naked, then when the police get you, you want to ask them, what's wrong? <laughs> so in N.A., this fellowship, this room of weirdos, that God has seen greatness in each of us, that he found this place and set us all here so we could experiment, because that's what this is. Trust me, it's an experiment. You don't know when you're going to break out on yourself. But that's okay. We'll say something real clever, Vern, like, just come here, baby, give me a hug, keep coming back. Don't use, you'll be okay. And it works. That's the craziest damn thing. When they released me from Timberland, sent the railroad that $138,000 bill, the only thing they gave me was an NA director. I said, this is some bullshit. <laughs> After all them learned people, all them doctors and psychiatrists looking at me every day, tell me, how do you feel? <laughs> They gave me a Narcotics Anonymous directory. Now imagine that. Here in this room are some of the most learned, educated, devious, diabolical people known to mankind. Long before Al-Qaeda, they had us in the neighborhood. <laughs> We, we, we them people were trying to sell a wig to a bald head, man. A lawnmower doing a blizzard. You know what I mean? And, 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 and you know, the, the people in here are so learned. We them people who get up with $2 and a good idea and use dope all day. You got to be a genius. How do you take $2? and a good idea and go on a two-week run. How does that happen? So now this genius, and I'm going to wrap this up. So now this genius has turned to a madman. Because the disease of addiction with time will tell you, you ain't got nothing else to give. Mm-hmm. It'll steal your voice. It'll say silly shit like, well, let the new people work on that. No, 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 no. No, 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 no. We're not going to do that. Those of us with time are going to show up here and still be the foundation that they can build this house on. We need to stay in place, allow the new ones to experiment, but we're going to watch their ass. <laughs> They're going to be under constant supervision. You ain't never off probation. Because here's what the literature says. I'm still in the third tradition in this same paragraph. It says, if something changes, listen to this now. This is the wisdom of the Celts. This is some shit so deep, I think it must have been written by God himself. If something changes, a breakup, a move, a death, and that group is no longer the center of our recovering life, we expand our horizons. 
We expand our horizons and our network. We expand. We don't fold. We them people, man, listen. You remember when they had you surrounded and you, they, you just knew they had you. The popo was right there. You didn't see no way out. But somehow you come from up under that thing. Right? I'm talking about we showed great courage even though we was cowards because we were driven by a power greater than ourselves that we couldn't recognize, let alone explain. Listen to what it says here now. So we expand our rise in our network. We find ways to give back. Old timers, we find ways to give back. It don't have to be sponsorship. It just, just go sit your ass in the meeting and look at them. <laughs> like, really? That's what I do in the meeting. I just sit there. Why are you staring at me? Am I staring at you? <laughs> because it's our obligation. The, the, for those of you who study particular uh, uh, dogmas, you know, they say if you spare that rod, you ruin the child. Well, what is the rod? I'm glad you asked. <laughs> Responsibility, obligation, and duty. It's my responsibility. I got 30 years. It's my responsibility to sit here, be the foundation, so that the next generation can continue to build on the hard-won experience that all of us has went through. It's the responsibility. And unless that's taught, it'll be lost. The obligation comes from what I said to God in the first step, that I'd become willing to do whatever was necessary to stay clean, even the things I didn't like doing. Y'all remember that line? Yeah. It's still there. That, that's still in the book. It's my obligation. When Pat called me, it was my obligation to say, thank you, God. You still got some usefulness for an old Dauphine. New people, if you're under 30 years, this is where God recycles. <laughs> this is his recycling center. We got enough goddamn medications and, and false parts and shit to start a museum. <laughs> e Eli Lilly is living large right now. Obligation. Because God did something for you that you could never do for yourself. It's my duty to show up here. That's right. Come on, see. I pray. Because I pray a lot. I had to pray a lot to be me. Because I'll transform into somebody else. You know, in my magical magnifying mind, I'm still P.D. Wheatstraw, the devil's son-in-law. <laughs> And if I ain't Petey Weestraw, I want to be John Holmes, the porn star. <laughs> uh, y'all got y'all story. I'm just telling mine. <laughs> you know, so, so don't be, you, you, you don't get to get by with that. It's your responsibility, it's your duty to be exact with the new people. Because they're going to get their hard-won experience because they ain't going to listen no goddamn way. But we need to be there when they show back up with them arrows hanging out their ass. <laughs> saying, how was that? <laughs> the last line in this says, listen now, we find ways to give back to make sure that our fellowship is always growing. We make sure that our fellowship is always growing. And we're always growing, too. I came here to Atlanta to grow. I came here to let you know after 30 years, I'm still feel like a nut most days. But that's just a feeling. It'll pass. <laughs> I'm here to tell you that in spite of all that I've been through, I ain't quit. 
I live with this wonderful 90-year-old who at any given moment, I, you see, keep, keep looking at the phone said, because I'm checking the camera to make she ain't, sure she ain't pulling no stunts. <laughs> and I don't want none of the good deacons coming from the church talking about, uh, hey, how are you? Because <laughs> you know, you can have a spiritual catastrophe too. So the last line says that our fellowship keeps alive and free, right? And the work we do to help it grow ensures there will continue to be members in meetings here when we need them. Old timers need meetings. We need meetings. We need meetings and we need the new people to stay there, be green and growing so we don't get ripe and start rotting. I make five meetings a week. I ain't got no goddamn job. I'm in the hardcore unemployment. <laughs> I've been retired eight years now. <clears throat> But what that gave me was, was an opportunity to give back to the fellowship. Oh, I'm not the one who sit around. I ain't the bleeding deacon in the meeting. I just want to sit there and listen. Because the gift of listening is preparing me for the gift of learning. And it was the members who was here before me that told me, like old folks used to say when we was down south, me and Johnny, and them old folks would tell you, boy, just keep living. Boy, just keep living. Boy, just keep living. I never got that. What's this old keep living shit? And then I kept living. And now I tell the new people, boy, just keep living. And I tell the new members that are coming into the fellowship, just keep coming back. Just keep coming. More going to be revealed. And if you don't pay attention, you'll go through a lot of PMS. Now, what's PMS? Pain, misery, and suffering. It's available to us all. Thank you all for letting me share.